Well, if you have your Bibles, uh, turn to 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 40 to 46, and then also uh, put your finger there, and then we're going to also be reading from uh, chapter 19, verses 1 through 5. We're in part four of our message series, Higher Definition Living. Our age is an inf information technology age. Everything is becoming more high, higher definition. Your screens, your iPhone 10s are so much better high resolution than when the first iPhone came on out. Your TVs are much better than that. And we try to define and we think that getting higher definition is better. And yes, it is better, but we're supposed to get defined not by what the world says needs to be better refined and defined, but really by God's word. And today, uh, it's found in 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 40 to 46, and verses 19, verses 1 through 5. And we have a tradition here of standing up for the reading of God's holy word. And so I want to ask that we all stand up to honor the reading of God's holy word. As I read it out loud, if you silently read along with me. I know it's a little bit of a lengthy passage, but stay with me because it's, it's really perfect pertinent to um, what I feel the Lord has pressed upon my heart to share with each and every one of you. 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 40 to 46, and verses 19, verses 1 through 5. If you're already on the same page with me, can I get a loud amen? Okay. Oh, can I get a loud amen? All right. All right. Let me read a loud God's holy word. Then Elijah commanded them, seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone get away. They seized them, and Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered there. And Elijah said to Ahab, the king of Israel, Go and eat, go eat and drink, for there is the sound of a heavy rain. Point to someone and say, I hear the sound of a heavy rain. All right, I hear the sound of a heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground, and put his face between his knees. Imagine that picture right there. Go and look toward the sea, he told his servant, and he went up and looked. There is nothing there, he said. Seven times. Everybody say seven times. Elijah said, go back. Point at someone and say, go back. Go back. All right. The seventh time, Elijah reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, Hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds. The wind rose. A heavy rain started falling. That reminds me of what happened last Sunday, right? And Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came on Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Now, skip on down to 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 5. 1 Kings 19, 1 through 5. Let me read it out loud. Now, Ahab told Jezebel, that is his evil, wicked, nefarious wife. Sounds evil too, doesn't it? Jezebel. Right? Now, Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets of Baal, that is, with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the God, see the small letter, she was a pagan, she didn't believe in the God of the Bible, the God of, uh, of Israel, may the small letter G gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Putting in modern translation, and I know some of you, I hope you don't get offended by what I say, putting in vernacular, she was basically saying to Elijah, I'm going to get you, sucker. That's what she basically was trying to say. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom brush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Can you point to someone and say, have you had enough? Point to someone that just asked that question, have you had enough? Well, I said, he said, I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestor. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. Can you point to that same person and say, God's telling you to get up and eat. God's telling you to get up and eat. 
You may be seated in the presence of the Lord, and as you're, get, as you're getting seated, I want to bring to you the idea of the thin line between success and failure. The thin line between success and failure. There is such a fine line indeed, because consider this, dear friends. A farmer prays for rain so that the crops will come in, aut- in, in the autumn season. At the same time, a beach lifeguard prays for no rain so he could have a job. God answers one, so one to one is a success and the other is a failure. Those of you who lived in the East Coast, I remember when I was a little child in the winter and the weatherman said, snow is coming, I would pray before I would go to bed. Please, God, let it snow like crazy. And I would wake up at 3 in the morning looking outside to see if there's any rain. I would pray, please, God, Let it snow, let it snow, let it snow so that I don't have to go to school. But my parents prayed an opposite prayer that night. Lord, don't let it snow so that my kid will go to school. So God answers a prayer. To one, it's success, and to the other, it's a failure. The thin line of success and failure. It's so thin that consider this Michael Phelps in the Olympics won the 100-meter butterfly event by a margin of 0.01 seconds. He won it in 50.58 seconds, I believe it was, or 38 seconds. And the second-place person came 0.01 second behind. You know how much of a difference that is? They said it's the difference of a fingertip. So the second-place guy lost it by just one tip of a fingertip, the length of a fingertip. And you know, psychologists say this, they studied this, they found out that people who come in second are more miserable, more unhappy, and more despondent than the person who came in third place. Or people that came, didn't meddle at all. You know why? The person who came in second is fixated of how close he or she was to winning. But because they were so close and yet they were so far, they're fixated on it and robs them of joy. But the third place guy is happy. Because he knows that there were two other people that were ahead of him or her, and so they're fine with it. So there is a fine line. You could be so close to success and failure. And here we see a passage here, one of the greatest prophets in the, all the Old Testament, the prophet Elijah, the Bible says... He didn't even die like all the rest of the people. God took him off in a chariot of fire into heaven. A man who prayed in this previous passage here of this passage that we read, he called fire down and fire came from heaven. One of the greatest prophets of Israel, and yet God gives an account of him going through an episode of great discouragement and despair. He had sustained mountaintop success, and now he was in the dark valley of failure. And yet we see it just happened just in one flip of a switch. So I want to share with you what is the thing line between success and failure because so much of that determines and also robs us of our joy. And God wants us to be victorious Christians. Can I get an amen, right? So everybody take your right hands, finger stretch it out to the heavens above. As you're seated, don't you have to stand. Receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I remember, every person here is a minister. We're all ministers and priests of God. Can I get an amen, right? So receive that anointing. And now find three other people and make, make, eye, make eye contact with the person. Say, there's a thin line between success and failure. There's a thin line between success and failure. Everybody say, thin line. I'm going to share with you just some things about this from this passage here. The truth of the matter is that many of us try to shun or are ashamed of our failures, but I want to let you know this. God actually puts failures as an ingredient in our lives. In fact, as it goes to my first point, I want to share with you about the whole issue, the topic of successes and failures in life, the highs and lows. I want to put it out there to you that actually Failures are actually the launch pad for your, the greatest successes in your life. Here we see in this passage here 
the passage that we read, Elijah and the pretext and the, of the passage that we read had called fire down and fire came down on his offering. And as a result, the people said, the Lord, your God is really God. And so he grounded up all the false prophets of Baal and Asherah, almost a little less than a thousand, and he had them slaughtered. So think about this. He's on a high. Fire comes down when he prays. God answers his prayer. Everyone's like, man, that man Elijah, he is the man. What a prophet he is indeed. And he slaughters the false teachers there. And then not only that, he goes to the king Ahab, who is an evil king, and he tells them that the nation of Israel had been a drought for three and a half years. God's word comes to Elijah and tells him, tell Ahab that rain is coming. So he tells him, go, hitch up your chariot and get something to need because why? Rain is coming. And Elijah prays. And yet, he had to fight for it because his servant's there. He puts his head between his knees. He prays, go see if there's anything coming. Comes back, I see nothing. Meets failure. Then he tells him, go back. Each time, I see nothing. Experience is failure. I'm praying. God's word came to me. He said, there's rain. I'm praying. Nothing's happening. And then finally on the seventh time, he doesn't give up. He says, go and see it to his servant. And his servant comes back and says, yes, I see a cloud, but it's as small as a man's hand. It's rising from the sea. And from that, from that small thing became the greatest, one of the greatest miracles. The drought in the land was overcome by the rains of God. So I want to posit out to, to, to you that God's ingredient for your life prescription is you're going to go through successes and you're going to go through failures. And why do I include this mess series? You know why? Because the truth of the matter is, matter is we need to define ourselves by God and God alone. Can I get an amen? Can I get a louder amen to that? You need to be defined by God and Christ and his perfect righteousness. But the truth of the matter is we really do define our lives by our successes. If you came out of a good school, oh, I graduated from Harvard. I came out of UC Berkeley or UCLA. I work for Accenture or Deloitte & Touche or KPMG Consulting. We like to define our lives upon our successes. And on the other hand, there are other people who are defined by their failures. Maybe some people have been wrecked and marked Oh, I feel like a failure because I didn't get accepted by that school. Oh, I don't want to share what I got on my SATs because my friend's got a better grade or better grade point average. Oh, this person has a better job and lives better than me. And so you are marked by failure and you're defined by it. Every time you're about to step forward in God, all of a sudden you're reminded of your failure. And we're so marked by these things, and as a result, subconsciously, we are marked by either the failures in our life or sex or combination. And the, the truth of the matter is, it's normal. Point to someone and say, tell them and, and encourage them and say, it's normal, it's normal, it's normal. Because God actually wants us to experience this. Because you cannot have success without failure. Can I get an amen to that? And the truth of the matter is, when Elijah experienced this, he's so down and out that he leaves his servant and he goes up to Mount Carmel and he's like, God, I can't take it anymore. Let me die, God. Just a flip of a switch. One of the greatest miracles, fire comes down from heaven. I mean, think about this. On this, I say, Father, fire come and the fire comes down. You'd be like, wow. And it's been a drought. And he goes to the king, the leader, the king of the nation said, rain's coming. And he prays, and though, although it doesn't happen right, he perseveres, and rain comes. He should be on cloud nine. And then right after he, being on cloud nine, Ahab goes to his wife, his evil wife Jezebel, and tells him he killed all the prophets of Baal. And then Jezebel says, I'm going to get you. And then as a result, he gets afraid and he runs. He says, Take my life, God. And then God tells him, and then the word of the Lord comes to him in 1 Kings 9. He says, what are you doing here? Can you point to someone next? Just encourage them. What, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? What are you doing here? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord. I've been so faithful. I've been, I've been so hardworking for you, God. 
Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, tore down your altars, and put your prophets dead with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. Now, from the highs of success, now he's saying, God, my life is at the pits. Where are you in all this? I'm the only one zealous. I've been faithful to you. Now he's marking a life by the latest circumstance. Can I challenge you? Don't mark your life by your successes and failures because they will come and go. But mark your life and define it by Jesus Christ alone. He alone can give you the definition that will set you free from all the other things that compete in your life. Can I get an amen to that? So I want to let you know this, that God gives us successes and failures. Some of the failures are self-induced. Others are God-ordained. Because it's not how we define, we think of failure as something that we see it, but God doesn't. When he prescribes it, that's not a failure to God. It's part of God's development program for our lives. And so I, I want to make this very clear because we all are affected no matter how many years you've been walking with the Lord. We're trying to mark our lives. God, is, is my life good based on success and failure? Let me try to drive this point home. You know, all the parents, all the parents, can I get a loud amen? If you're a parent, can I get a loud amen? Before I get into I want to challenge you. I don't care if your teenager is 16, 17 years old and much bigger than you. You as a parent better lay your anointed hand on your child. Put your hand through their hair, even though they don't like you messing up their hair. And you better pray a prayer of anointing over them each and every night. I don't care if they're listening to Spotify. Spot that place with a prayer of anointing over them right there. Because you know why? The reason why is our generation needs to experience difficulties and hardships and yet the glory of God through all those things. I still remember God honors the prayers of your parents. Like Elijah, he prayed seven times, it didn't rain, but in the seventh time, God will honor your prayers if you persevere in that way. No matter how much failure, I'm praying nothing, you persevere. I remember when my wife was pregnant with Colin on the inside. You know, in these times, I've got to be careful because my son is a teenager now, and I don't want to embarrass him in any way, but I hope this is a good thing. I hope he takes it as such. When he, my wife was praying with him, and I did those cares as well, I, I remember praying for Colin. I said, Lord, all I ask is this. Let him be a happy-go-lucky kid with an optimistic faith. May nothing bring him down. May he just be happy all the time. And the second thing I prayed was, may he be a leader of his generation. I don't care if he's wealthy or whatever. Let him be a leader. May he be the head and not the tail. The first. Those are the things I prayed almost every day when I laid hands on my wife's womb and prayed for my son. And you know, God is so true to our prayers. God has raised them up. Wherever he goes, it's like not trying, but he ends up being a leader. And you know what's so amazing? You know, he's a sophomore now. He's in high school. Yes, a teenager. Lord, help us in Jesus' name. Going through the hormones, his voice has changed. He's taller than me. I used to be like, Colin, go to your room. Now like, Colin, go to your room. And yet, you know, he, he you know, and I try to, we, we, we have our hopes, you know, like, okay, he's going to be, I want him to play high school baseball. And, you know, we'll see where it goes from there. Maybe well, well, it's all in God's hands. And, you know, he made the, um, we're not bo boasting name, but he made the uh, uh, varsity team, and he, he was playing. And then he breaks his pinky finger. This is where you as a parent realize what are you really marking your life on? Because he has slid into second base. And then a few minutes later, he comes out of the dugout, goes to the, uh, the uh, medical trainer you know, on the, from the school. And I'm like, hey, what are you doing? Out? What, what are we doing? Out? Go, go, go back on the field. What are you doing? Dad, I, and his finger is like, <laughs> Okay, well, get, get ten to it and go back in. <laughs> and um, he didn't play. And then because of that injury, he missed the rest of the season, missed half the season. And my wife and I were like, after a soft, he only has two more years of baseball. He just wasted the rest of the season. And we were reminded, Colin, do you know what happened? Do you know what happened? You lost the rest of the season. And my son's like, yeah, I know, Dad. I know. And we're like, do you know what happened? You're missing the rest of the season. I know, Dad. I know, Mom. My wife's like, Colin, do you know what happened? You, you broke your finger. 
I know, mom and dad. And he'll be like, get off my case. And we'll lay hands, in Jesus' name, be healed over there. So he come back, come back before them, and he missed the rest of the season. And you know what? And because of that, it was robbing us of our joy. And we'll be like, Colin, you just missed the season of playing for varsity football. I know, dad. Why do you have to remind me? And like, your future. And like, dad, why are you always on my case? I'm a good kid. I don't do drugs. I don't watch porn. I'm a good kid, Dad. And I'm like, I know, but do you know what you did to your season? And the Lord spoke to me just recently and said, Stephen, lighten up. Yeah, he's a good kid. And then I talked to my wife. God answers her. He's a happy-go-lucky kid. And he told me after some games, Dad, I miss playing. I want to be on the field, but my fingers aren't healing. But you know what? He was cheering for his teammates. He was being loud against the other team. Hey, pitcher, 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 hey, pitcher, pitcher, pitcher. Being so loud. And we were like, oh, pulling it down a little bit. You know, you represent Jesus and all. And, and yet he was so happy. Go look at my wife and I realized, oh, God really did honor a person. No, we were upset at this setback, but he was still rejoicing. We're trying to mark him by, look what happened to your finger. Can I just tell you, can I tell you, success and failure, they're just moments that will come and go. But we hold on to it like it marks our lives. And God wants us to know that like Elijah, he had some great successes, and then the latest incident was a failure, and he got marked by that. You need to be free from that in Jesus' mighty name. Can I get an amen? You need to be free and let Christ define your life. You are defined by Christ's righteousness and his success on the cross of Calvary. Somebody shout amen to that right now. So point to someone next day, what are you defined by? What are you defined by? What are you defined by? And I want to challenge all of you. There's some of you, if you've been so miserable, you're wondering, God, why didn't I get into that school? God didn't want you to get into that school. God, your failures do not mess up God's plans for your life. Your successes will not also add to God's plans for your life. God's plans are God's perfect plans. Can I get an amen to that? And that's why you need to trust in the will of God and make yourself available. Stop grinding it out to be successful. Instead, be grounded in Jesus alone. Stop the grinding and stay remain grounded in Christ. And that will determine the ultimate outcome of your moments of success and failure into the progress and momentum of God's plans being unfolded in your life. The second thing I want to share with you is the fact that the fear of failure is what really grips us. Everybody say the fear of failure. The fear of failure. We don't want to fail. And can I say this, and, I, uh, and please get me on this. As I was studying for this passage here and studying it through, we all have a fear of failure. People don't want to fail in front of people because we, our fear of failure is that we'll be found out by other people. And can I, the Lord just spoke to me on this, and it just really hit me like a freight train, and I hope that it will be a blessing to you. If you have the fear of failure, it's an indication that you have some sort of fear of man. Why? Because the Bible says the perfect love of God casts out what? All fear. So the perfect love of God casts out all fear. So if you have some fear of man, that indicates if you, that, that you don't have the perfect love of God. You're receiving it, but also you're wanting the love of man. And that means that your life is a little dependent upon whether you get man's approval or not, man's clan clap or not, all these things, man's praises or not. And that's why it comes from an idea that we need to have this pressure to succeed. I got to do well in this because of this. what's your driving force in that way? And we have a pressure to succeed and to make things happen. And you have this fear of man because I want people to like me. I want people to, 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 to say nice things to me. I want, people to come. I want people to praise me. And therefore, as we, we have a fear of failure because it shows that we have a fear of man. But when you have the perfect love of God that casts out all fear, then you fear no man. Can I get an amen to that? And that's why when you have the perfect love of God, you can sing, I can raise my hallelujah in Jesus' name. Why? I'm going to sing a little 
little louder. I'm going to sing a little clap a little louder. Why? In the presence of my enemies? Because I don't fear my enemies. I don't fear any man because I have the perfect love of God that completes me. Somebody shout amen to that right now. It is the perfect love of God. And when you're loving and you receive the love of God and all your concern is about the love, the perfect love of the Father that casts out all fear, you don't have to fear any man. You don't have to fear your boss. You don't have to fear the future because you know that God is with you all the time. Can I get an amen? So the fear of failure going deeper is not only the pressure to succeed and the pressure to perform. I've got to perform to win these people over. I gotta perform so that they'll like me and think I'm good. I gotta perform. And you know what? So many of us seeing, most of us here are Asian American, it's a performance culture. I still remember it. I thought that I had to perform well. My parents were great parents, but I thought I had to perform this to get my dad's approval. And I still remember, like, it was, and my dad's a great, he's up in, the, uh, up in heaven with the Lord, dancing up and down for, before Jesus, cancer-free and all that. Praise God for that. But I still remember it. I uh, got one B in high school. One stinking B in typing class. Got A's in AP biology, AP physics, calculus, and all that. One stinking B. I still remember, my dad's like, what's this B? It's typing class. I'm sorry, Dad. I only type 35 words a minute. <laughs> and uh, he's like, what does that be? He was so fixated on the B and not the other, all the other A's. And I wanted to, what do I need to do to get my dad's approval? And so I strived after that, and we're in this performance culture. But I still remember, he, he didn't tell me, good job. But I remember calling his friend, Mr. Lee. Oh, guess what my son got on his report card? He got an A in AP biology, he got all A's, and just got one B. I'm like, we're telling him that. How come you're not saying anything to me? And so I had this performance culture mentality. I had to perform. And I pray that the spirit of performance and conformity to please man will be broken in the name of Jesus Christ right here. I pray it'll happen. If there's any lingering spirit in our worship team, I break it in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. You're not competing with one another. You will stop spending your energy competing, trying to get ahead of someone else in your life right now. You're not here to compete with someone at work. You're not here to compete with your teammate. You're not here to compete with someone, a student at school. No, you're here because we're God's family and we're competing and fighting against the devil. We have one enemy that's the devil alone. Can I get an amen to that? So any spirit of, oh, that person saying better than me, give God praise for that, that God used to in that way. And praise God that God has a different blessing for you. Can I get an amen to that? So stop comparing and competing. You're happy with your house until you see your friend's house, which is much larger than yours. You have a nice car, and then someone gets a new car, and then all of a sudden you got to compete in that way. The game of comparison and competition is what makes us and drives us to constantly feel like we're not competing and we're not able to keep up. But I want to challenge you. Stop competing and comparing. Lift your eyes upon Jesus, and he will complete your identity. Prada does not complete your identity. Mercedes-Benz, if you have it, praise God, but that does not complete your identity. Your last name does not complete your identity. My name is Stephen William Chong, but the end is that I am a redeemed and saved child of God. That's what defines me. So I don't need titles. You don't need titles. We need to stop being... So caught up with like, I gotta perform, I gotta perform, I gotta perform, and need to understand that fear is something that grips us and we, our fear of failure. But can I say this? Fear, like I said, is an ingredient that God uses to bring your success. In fact, let me say this fear is the very ingredient that God's success comes out of. Fear is, uh, uh, failure is necessary. Failure is necessary for God's miracles to come through. Failure is the ingredient. Let me get this right. Got it stumbling in my head. Failure is the ingredient that God uses for his miracles. Think about this. Every miracle in the Bible was Jesus overcoming a failure. Every breakthrough was God overcoming and defeating a failure. 
Jesus forgave the adulterous woman who failed in her purity and in her marriage. And yet God forgave her and gave her the miracle of grace and forgiveness. The blind man failed in his ability to see, and yet Jesus heals him and allows him to see. The woman with the issue of bleeding, she tried money and all these doctors, but they failed to provide the healing that only Jesus can provide. Jesus turns two fish and five loaves into fruit that multiplies and feeds the multitudes. Why? Because the disciples failed to provide the food to, meet, to feed the multitudes. Jesus turned water into wine because the wedding planners failed in their planning to provide and add, supply enough wine for all the reception guests. So I want to challenge you, dear beloved people of God. God is not limited by our failures. In fact, God uses those failures as a very ingredient to bring about the greatest miracle in your life. So I want to point, I want to ask that you point to someone and say, God's going to use your failure. God's going to use your failure. And if you really believe that, somebody shout amen right now. You're not shouting to me. You're shouting unto God and to your situation. Somebody shout amen right now. I want the spirit of failure and fear and succeeding and performing and company be broken in Jesus' mighty name. If someone gets blessed, praise God all the more for it anyway. If someone's song on the worship team is better than your song, praise God anyway. It wasn't about people looking at you. It's about people being reflecting onto God himself anyway. So I want to challenge all of you. Let's be a people that's no longer just driven by I need to perform, I need to perform. And on the other hand, let me say this. I'm not asking for you to be lazy and do nothing. Don't take this wrong and say, hey, I don't have to do, perform or do anything. Where's your team? I'm not performing, Pastor Sam, so I'm not going to sing up here. No, you still need to do your excellence for God, but it's the audience that determines why you're doing it. And if you're performing, you're doing it for the crowd. But when you're praising, you're doing it for the Christ. And so that's the whole idea. And I pray that even amongst our youth here, because our culture today, it's crazy being a high schooler these days. I mean, I had pressure growing up in high school, but nowadays, man, they make things so much harder to get into college these days. You know why? Parents are trying to outdo one another. Oh, it's Teacher Appreciation Week. Bring one flower each student. Parents bring bouquets because they want favor on their child and all that. But I pray in Jesus' name, and parents, if your kid doesn't get into Harvard, praise God. As long as they're staying in the will of God, God will do exceedingly abundantly more than we ever ask or imagine. God's word says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. So God's plans are better than your parents' plans. Can I get an amen to that? And as long as the Bible says God uses all things, good and bad, successes and failures, mountain eyes and valley lows, God uses all things for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So as long as you're raising your child to love God and are living for God's purpose, you don't have to worry. God's plans that he knows will happen for their lives. And so I hope that there will be just a, a strength and encouragement to free you that you know that you don't have to be fearful of man anymore. Point someone to someone and say, you don't have to be fearful of man. You don't have to be fearful of man. You don't have to walk into your office next time and be afraid of any man because you know the perfect love of God fills your heart. You don't, you don't have to go to school uh, t tomorrow or uh, Tuesday since tomorrow is a holiday, and you're going to feel like, man, I don't match up to these people because you have the perfect love of God that casts out all fear. You don't have to worry about the person that's, that's over you and bullying you and harassing you because you know the fact that the perfect love of God casts out all fear. You're not defined by what they say or don't say. You're not defined by what they do or don't do to you. You're not defined whether they give you honor or not because you are a child of God, and God's perfect love completes you all the more. And that's what God wants us to be free of. And I hope that you get it right there. So again, point to someone and say, have no fear, God is near. Have no fear, God is near. The third thing I want to share with you is the fact that your focus, everybody say your focus. Your focus determines your success or failure. It says, 
Why are you doing here? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord. The Israelites have rejected your covenant and torn down your altars and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. I didn't put the rest of the passages here, but you know what's so amazing? Elijah was wallowing in his failure because he's got his focus off of God. Maybe he was looking at a success, and now all of a sudden it turned into failure. But the thing is, your focus shouldn't be on your success or your failure, but upon God and God alone. And as a result, when you do that, you will be able to experience a freedom wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whoever you're with, that you'll be able to experience a freedom that God gives to you, that you could really walk and know that success is really remaining faithful to where God has called you and turning wherever you are into a place of glory unto God. Let me get this. Let me say it again. Success is glorifying God wherever you are, however you are, whatever your circumstance, and whoever you're with. Because whoever you're with, wherever your circumstance, however you are, those are not to dictate whether it's success or failure or not. Wherever you are, you turn it and you glorify God right there. You see, God spoke to and brought him to the mountain. Go and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. And we get caught up with success. Oh, all of a sudden a huge wind came. That's God. But God was not in the wind, the Bible says. Then a huge earthquake came. Man, God's shaking things up, but God was not in the earthquake, it says. Then a huge fire came after the earthquake, but God was not in the fire. We get so caught up with the big things that attract our eyes, but then it says, then the small whispering voice of God came to Elijah. He says, why are you here? I'm tired, God. I've been zealous for the Lord. And you know what the amazing thing is? God's remedy is he tells him, go back the way you came. Just like he told the servant, go back, go back, go back, go back the way you came. And I want to challenge you that all of us here as beloved people of God, as we're here at Church of Revival Church and what God has called us to do, I want us to stop focusing upon our circumstances, surrender to God, and don't worry about it, trust it in Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen to that? I don't care if you have a lack right now, because if God is good all the time, believe in that proper biblical theology and trust that God is still going to take care of you. He's not going to let you fall. Can I get an amen to that? And whatever your failure, maybe you feel like you haven't been able to do things. Can I encourage you? We err in two ways. One, failure is our dis disappointment with our own expectations. Is there the, I wanted this. I was expecting this, God. And when God doesn't go through, we get disappointed, and we think that's a failure. But you have to understand that God works all things out. And when you trust in God in that way, it's not a failure in God's eyes because it's not going to remain a failure. It becomes the greatest thing. Just like the cross, a symbol of shame, became the greatest symbol of victory right there. So God's going to turn it around. And the second area, area that we err is the timing. Everybody say timing. We want God to do things right away like yesterday. But God takes his own time in that way. So the focus is not on, God, are you doing this? Why aren't you doing this? But remain focused upon the Lord. And when you focus upon the Lord, God's the one. You do your best for God and leave the rest for God to take care of. God's the one that makes you fruitful. You can't produce fruit on your own. It's you remain focused upon God. God will allow the fruit to come about. And, you know, as I close, I want to just say this because the Lord just... Um, Really just um, spoke to my heart. Uh, most of the worship team last night had to leave because the session was going late at the conference. My wife and I stuck it through, and, um, and there was some closing worship. And uh, I was so convicted and moved again because the Lord reminded me a couple of things. At the end, they were singing, I forget what song it was, but, you know, they, they, they were worshiping all out. And I felt God was saying, Stephen, why aren't you going all out? I'm like, God, I'm clapping. I'm, I'm, I'm worshiping. And the Lord said, no, you're not. You're holding some little bit back. And I said, well, what is it, God? And I felt the Lord was saying, Stephen, whatever is remaining that you're keeping from me is what's keeping me. Surrender it all to me. And what was so, uh, so convicting was, you know, at Bethel, 
and, and our church, if you love the worship team, let's give them a big hand clap of praise. Let's encourage them. God's starting to raise them up. And I want to I wanna say a prophetic word. You remain focused upon the Lord, and his light will shine brighter upon you guys. You get your focus upon off the Lord on the, on the light of man, it will fade. But you focus on the Lord, the light will become brighter. Can you get an amen, right? But one of the things that blew me away was this. The worship team people, you know, they're all great and gifted. But one thing that struck me was this. It's almost like, yeah, they were encouraging the people to worship and all that. But it's almost like they didn't really care how the people were responding. It was just me and my God. Oh, some people are not worshiping. I don't care. I'm worshiping. Oh, some people are clapping. Some people are not. I don't care. I'm worshiping. So there were some people that were on their knees worshiping. And I love this because it's kind of, uh, I was not like that. I grew up Southern Baptist, so it's very stoic worship. But I saw one of the female singers, she was like going. And I, this one acoustic guitar is like, she stopped playing. He's like. And I thought, what a freedom. They look like fools, but they didn't care. You know why? They didn't care about the praises of man. They were concerned about praising God. Oh, they regarded the audience less and regarded God more. So regardless is to regard yourself and man less and regard God more. And so you know what I started to do? My wife noticed it. I started going, 50-year-old man in section NN405. And I just started going, and I felt God was saying, Stephen, remember when you were younger? You used to just jump and dance. And you didn't care. You wanted to be undignified because you just wanted to celebrate me. Why aren't you doing that now? And so I said, God, I'm going to do this. And I started, I, I picked up a new move. I used to go like this. And I was in front of, I was like. And it's a good exercise too, by the way, if you're doing fit for the king, by the way. You know, you should do this every Sunday so that you could tell your fit, fit to the king leader that you're doing your exercise. And I, when they were just singing, I started just shouting, Jesus, yes, God. And you know what? My heart became so free. Because my focus was upon God and God alone. I looked like a complete idiot, like a fool. But I didn't care because to my God, I was so pleasing to his eye. Can I ask you as I close? Was your worship pleasing to the one audience of God? And I want to challenge all of you, whether you're going through something bad or not. I know you're going through difficulties. But the way to turn into success, whatever situation you're in, turn it into glory for God. You have cancer, I still glorify you. This body, this temple, even though it has cancer, will still glorify and praise the name of Jesus. I don't have a job, but I still have a job. My job is to praise Jesus no matter what right there. So I may not have enough money, but I don't care. Money doesn't make my hands go up higher. Jesus lifts me up anyway. I'm going to raise up a little higher right there. So I'm still not married. It doesn't matter because Jesus is my first love. I'm going to worship him all the more, all the farther. So I want to challenge you people. Let's put our worship on like never before. I want us to be a shift in our church. Everybody say shift. Shout even louder, shift. All right. I don't care if you're Presbyterian, frozen chosen. I don't care if you're a Southern Baptist. I don't care if you come from Bedside Baptist. You rather lie down in your worship service. I want to challenge you. Let's be people filled with the Spirit of God because we're all temples of the Holy Spirit. Can I get a loud amen to that right now? I want you to wake up, shove somebody next to you, and shout, tell them, wake up. Shove that person say, wake up. Shove the other person next to say, wake up. I want us to be a church. That praise is so loud that when the principal comes and the teachers come, they're wrecked by the presence of God. I don't know which God, how big your God. My God is that big. Can I get an amen to that? And his praise deserves the highest from all of his people. Don't worship your circumstance. Make your circumstance glorify and worship God. So I want you to stand to your feet right now.